Um, and again, if you guys haven't, uh, or if you missed a talk earlier in the day, you want to see it, the discs are available for sale right outside the door. If there's a talk you really like so much, you want to watch it over and over again, they're for sale. At the end of the day, the whole sets should be available for purchase. So if you want to wait till the end, you can grab them all at once at a discount price versus buying them individually. Uh, we have the after party tonight. Uh, it's the party for the staff and speakers and so forth, but as attendees, if you're still in town, if you're hanging out, please come join us. We'll announce details during the closing remarks tonight. And um, I think that's about all the announcements I have other than tour camp. If you want to go ahead and buy your ticket at a discount, do it at the front desk today before the price goes up. And now uh, we're moving on, I guess, to our talk, Mask Your Check Sums. Um, Eric Davidson is here, so please welcome him to the TourCon stage. Uh, this is my first tour con, so thanks for having me. Um, I'm enjoying myself. Um, this is <laughs> this is all uh, TCP and IP header-based checksums, so I'm already surprised how many people are here because it's not that interesting. Um, and actually, before I get into that, this is kind of all the theme of uh, people trying to mask or sanitize their data but not being successful at it, um, and that's always something that's kind of interesting to me. Um, so before I get into that, we uh, when we drove into San Diego from Phoenix, we uh, went to this pizza shop in Gila Bend, and um, Let's open up a picture of it real quick here. <laughs> okay, so uh, I guess uh, Prince Harry uh, was in this pizza shop and he wrote a letter to the mayor or whatever talking about how awesome the pizza was. Um, and so that's the kind of a crappy picture of it, but if we zoom into another part of it, we get a part that they scribbled out, I thought they did, um, and has a phone number there. And if you, it's hard to see anyway because well, I scribbled it out, but not so hard where I don't see a 4-4 uh, country code. So I know that's UK. Um, so I'm not going to do anything with this, but I did send it off to Rob Carter. So we'll see what he does with that. PLA. Phone losers. Okay, so my actual presentation. What this is actually about um, is when people send packets like this to uh, organizations like SANS.org or whatever to try to troubleshoot or uh, inform or whatnot. Um, typically, they will, they're, they're submitting packets from their, their own company, so they want to mask things like the IP address of their company um, for privacy. Uh, otherwise, uh, like GitHub, or not GitHub, but like Pastebin and um, Stack Overflow and all that, people don't mask their checksums, and that's cool. Um, I don't even know why I'd mask my own, but uh, my only point is if you're going to do it, do it right. So um, in this case, this specific packet, and this is a real packet uh, dump that I found on SANS.org, uh, we will reverse those X's that show up on the... Um, 10 line there. Uh, it's it's trivial actually uh, using the checksums that they don't mask and I've never seen anybody mask checksums. So this isn't groundbreaking. I mean this this post was like from a decade ago but along the line people still aren't masking. Uh, it's common uh, knowledge to mask your IP um, and TCP and checksums. Um, it's even been recommended to sanitize the checksums um, and people still don't. So I'm going to do this. But first, a major digression, because that's what I do. Uh, so we'll talk about barcodes first, because it's easier to visualize, it's simpler, um, and we can actually see the kind of the, the attack going. Um, and the attack is really similar to a hash-based uh, password attack. Um, so barcodes have checksums, too. This is a barcode, and we're actually going to be using this barcode as an actual product. So those, those are the numbers up there. Um, to calculate the, che the, the checksum, it's, it's actually more complicated than a TCP or IP header checksum, but what we do is we take all the odd numbers, uh, we add them up, and then we multiply that by three, then we take all the even numbers and add those to that sum, and then whatever number it would take to take that sum to add to it to make a number divisible by 10 is the checksum. <laughs> so it's a mouthful, but we'll actually run through it um, with that actual barcode. Um, not that it matters, so that's why I'm kind of racing um, at that in Red Bull. Uh, we take all the odd numbers up in the first line there, we add them all together, multiply it by 3, so that's 51. Then we take all the even numbers, add them all up, and then add them to that 51, and we get 63. So the number it would take to get to a, another number that's a multiple of 10, which is 70, we'd have to add 7 to that to make 70. And you'll notice that the last uh, character on that uh, barcode is, is 7, and that is the checksum. So what if we lost a digit? Um, in this case, I'm just randomly picking the eighth digit and putting a question mark there. We don't know what the eighth digit is. Um, or say for some reason that that, that digit was uh, sensitive, which doesn't make any sense for a checksum, but hypothetically. Um, we could use the checksum to brute force out 
that character we don't know. Um, and there is kind of a correlation with how large the checksum is versus how much data we can pull out, in this case, one character or one number. So here's an example of brute forcing it. Um, in yellow, that's our guess every time. And then we calculate the checksum based on that guess every time. So on the side, you see that. Um, and then that third attempt, uh, we get the checksum of seven, and it matches the checksum provided. So therefore, we know that that eighth digit is a two. Um, and you'll notice so that the 26207 there, if I go back to that barcode, you'll see the 26207. But wait, there's more. <laughs> so uh, going, in, going into the, the format of a uh, barcode a little bit more, uh, we typically we have the, the, the first uh, digit is the type of product, and then we got the left digits, the right digits, the checksum. Um, usually the left is the, the manufacturer, the right is the product, but not always, and I'll get into that real quick too. Um, so product types, kind of interesting. Uh, if it starts with three, it's typically pharma stuff, pills. Uh, zero, one, six, seven, and eight, those are the, the normal manufacturer slash product that I was talking about. Uh, coupons are five and nine. Uh, st store specific codes, and these ones are pretty interesting, uh, typically f two and four. Um, if you guys have a VIP card for a store or whatever, if you look at it, it, it should start with a four. Um, and actually, like a decade ago, I had a lot of fun with that, making universal um, VIP cards that we all used. The, these, some of these guys actually had them, but uh, I printed out like I don't know, 50 of them or whatever, brought them to a 2600 meeting, so we were all the same customer. Um, and then two is another interesting one where uh, it's custom to store but produce. So um, instead of uh, the normal manufacturer product thing, it's uh, the, the first digit of two, the next five is the type of product, and then the next digit is whether the next four digits is going to be weight or whether it's going to be price, and then the next four digits after that is the weight or the price, and then the checksum. Um, so the point of that, oh, I'll get to that in the next slide, but uh, <laughs> what I'll do is I'll go through the, the normal uh, manufacturer slash product thing. So this is our barcode. It starts with a zero, so it's a normal product. The next five digits define the manufacturer, Trojan. And then the next five digits after that is the, the type of product, ultra thin lubricated. So then that uh, the other one that starts with the two, we'll just say it's a banana. Um, the, the one, two, three, four, five digits, that's saying this is a banana. Um, for our store. Uh, the two, we'll assume, means that it's the, the weight, and one, two, three, four is the weight, and then we got our checksum of nine. And, um, and actually, I'm pretty sure that that checksum checks out, even though uh, that was completely a fake barcode. Um, so it, my main point of this is that uh, even though you can grab stuff from the checksums, there's also other stuff that can uh, leak data if you have other information to correlate, like out-of-band information than just the barcode itself. So um, in this case, if you actually weighed the product, then you might have uh, some more of the, the barcode, which is totally stupid. I'm done talking about barcodes. Uh, let's uh, relate that to TCP IP checksums. Um, so you, you do have the checksum. Um, for, for IP, it's a two byte. For TCP, it's also two byte. So that means you can get any two arbitrary bytes out of uh, TCP or um, IP. Um, being that uh, the TCP and IP uh, checksums refer to some of the same data with a pseudo TCP checksum, you can actually get even more data out of that. Uh, so about six arbitrary bytes. And then you can get even more without a band uh, data. So if you're uh, correlating with geo IP data, or uh, bogons or whatever, um, you can get even more information. And we'll do all of that uh, with that first packet I was talking about. So um, I kind of already covered that. Well, yeah, so the metaphor. Um, I, we can also filter out more things like uh, invalid type of stuff, like header links that are less than 20. Um, if you know the OS, you can kind of look at the TTLs and gather um, data to filter out from there. Um, bogus IP protocols, whatever. So then we're going to attack this guy here. That's our same packet again. This is uh, ASCII hexified. We maxed out, or yeah, maxed out those nibbles and with question marks, which is what my tool takes. And um, just this morning, I put it on GitHub. So I'm copying that over. It's probably really hard to see, but it doesn't matter at all. I mean, whatever. I should add quotes to this because there's uh, spaces in here and stuff, and it will freak out. There we go. So that's brute forcing. There we go. Um, so I'll just point out, um, if I can click right, there we go. So those were the question marks, 128.82. Those were the X's in this guy's packet. 
So that was actually trivial and easy. And just to look at some of the results, that's the IP address. Um, I dig it. It gets uh, odu.edu. It's the old Dominion University. And I can kind of cross-reference that to what this guy, I, I masked out this guy's name. Um, I tried to contact him, but this is as much as I'm going to do is mask out his name. I didn't want to completely call him out. But um, you'll notice uh, just a couple lines down, he says that we found a host on our large academic network. We know that to be true now. So what happens if we get hundreds of results? So we can still mask out more than the, what I said, the six bytes. We're just going to get several results, um, hundreds. Like technically, you multiply that number by 16 every uh, nibble we mask out. Um, so still, with the GOIP filtering and Bogon filtering, you can do a lot of powerful stuff with it. Um, but you want to get some out-of-band data. So GOIP, um, I need to know location, where this IP is coming from. So I um, did some reconnaissance and got this guy's LinkedIn profile. And the only thing really notable right here is the Norfolk, Virginia. Um, so I masked out a lot more of the IP. Normally, this uh, being that this is like kind of hacky Perl uh, proof of concept code, this would normally take about two hours. So uh, I just have a quick video, really small. I think I zoom in in a second, a little bit. And this is two hours worth of brute forcing right here, all summed up to 20 seconds. And then you can actually see the guesses it's trying to make and the hashes that it's trying to. That's the dash V switch. And I used a dash G for uh, GUIP and B for Bogon filtering. And a bunch of results. Uh, can't see right here. It doesn't really matter because I'm going to show you something else. Um, the important thing to note is that I made it comma separated. So being that that's the case, I output it to a CSV. And wow, it's a lot smaller on this resolution I have. But um, see, there's tons of results. And uh, notably, the that's the information we're trying to unmask. These are all the different IP addresses, because all the other fields are the same. But these IP addresses, they're all guesses. And we don't know which one's the correct one. These are all possible packets that it could be. And only one's going to be the case. But we correlated with GeoIP data. So for every IP address, we try to see where that could be located. So let's filter. We're going to do filter and just auto filter so we can uh, do the little drop down. So here's all the different cities it could be. Um, one of them is kind of pukey at the top. <laughs> and then we're going to go down to Norfolk. Uh, check all, Norfolk. One packet. There is IP address 128.82.78.134. We go back here. There's a couple of slides I had the IP in. Oh, I went too far. Fly through the matrix here real quick. There we go. So 128.82.78.134. And I speed ran through that. So <laughs> um, there's one other thing I wanted to say uh, just in, in some of my research, like all 30 seconds of it, because I really didn't know if there's a tool out here like this or how widespread this kind of attack was. But um, there are tools where you can automatically sanitize your PCAPs. Um, a lot of them that I researched were really, really crappy. Like they would mask the IP addresses, but they still left the checksum alone. So that doesn't make any sense to me. But there's another tool called TCP Purify, or uh, the P is shared, so TC Purify. Um, that actually will mask the checksums because what it does is it'll zero out the, the um, IP addresses and then recalculate the checksum based off of that. So that checksum is based on the, the bogus IP addresses. Um, so if you wanted to sanitize your data, I would just recommend, instead of doing it manually, just use TC Purify. Um, that's if you wanted to sanitize your checksums. This isn't really like a serious uh, security vulnerability. Personally, I wouldn't even mask my own stuff. I'm just saying if you're going to do it, do it. But um, any questions? <laughs> so I'm going to get him first. So uh, I imagine in, in most scenarios where people are posting uh, IPs that are masked, they're usually posting like a, a TCP dump with multiple consecutive packets all on all the same IP address, but because it's different data, the packets have different checksums. Yeah, which makes it even easier to attack. Yeah. Yeah, um, not yet. I mean, seriously, I just develop, started developing this tool a few weeks ago. Like I submitted this way late. Um, so. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. I, and I've been thinking about it, too. It would just add a little bit of complexity, but no, I'm all for that. And in fact, yeah, um, 
questions, but also future suggestions. I mean, I can still work on this. It's up on GitHub too, so if anybody wants to screw around with it. Um, Joe? <laughs> well, so I was uh, sort of going into that, like I said, with Stack Overflow, Pastebin, um, even Insecure.org, uh, a, a little bit, hardly ever. Um, even Sans.org, hardly ever. It's it's kind of surprising. Um, even though I was saying it really doesn't matter too much to mask it, I mean, really, you're just hiding your company. But for some companies, they care. Um, I, so. But what I have noticed is the people I do try to mask the checksums, there's not a single one that I wouldn't be able to reverse with this tool. Awesome. Yeah. So opening it up more to like log files and you know, that's a lot of us post stuff like that, like the page spread or whatever. So what what other things other than IP addresses would you recommend just to give it a control F4? Yeah, um so one thing probably the TTL, because um like and I could be wrong, correct me guys, but uh Linux usually the TTL starts around 64. Um, Windows currently I think it's about 128, but old school Windows like the 9x and below I think is 32. Um, AIX I think is something weird like 60 or something like that. But you can use TTL to kind of profile. So if, if a company is posting a bunch of uh, of their packet dumps, just from the TTL you can kind of profile whether they're a Windows or a Linux shop. Um, I'm trying to think of anything beyond that really. Um, in, in a sense, just kind of you know look at a. TCP IP cheat sheet for the headers and just kind of look at what you think might be sensitive to your organization, you know, but TTL is one of the first things I'd kind of look at. Uh, ports as well, maybe, you know, because it says what kind of services you're running, if that's sensitive, which is part of the TCP. Another a feature I'll probably add to is I'm not doing UDP right now, so, because um, that pretty sure has a checksum as well. One of the few things UDP does have. Are you trying to back calculate anything out of the calculations? Totally unintelligent. It's it's like a, a hash based brute force. So it, uh, you know, like John the Ripper in, the, in that kind of a sense. So um, I have a hash, but I'm not actually trying to do some kind of mathematical attack on the hash. What I'm doing is I'm guessing a password and then seeing if the hashes match up. So with that barcode example, that's almost exactly my method. It's just the, the, the dumbest way I could possibly do it, but it works. Um, maybe I can try to do it intelligently, but I don't know even how possible it is. Um, I do know though that the checksum, I didn't even mention like if you guys like the low level kind of stuff, I got three minutes left. Um, the, the way that uh, the checksum is calculated is you um, you take your IP or your header, you break it up into two byte words, you add them all up, and then you do a one's complement of that result. So an interesting thing about that checksum if, is if you reversed anything, any two byte thing, like you could literally reverse the, the source and destination IP address completely and you'd get the same checksum, which is actually a, a point that Judy Novak of, uh, I think, Sourcefire made in one of the SANS posts when people were asking about masking checksums. Um, she said something to the extent that, yeah, you should mask them, but I don't really see the point. I'm paraphrasing, but she's like, I don't see the point because, you know, things can get switched around and blah, blah, blah. But I think that's kind of uh, not missing the point necessarily, but it, it, it's not really relevant. Um, I'm, I'm going in assuming that there's no corruption. Um, and it's not a horrible assumption because with this actual example, um, I, I got, when I did the dig, I got a university and this guy's talking about his university. You know, it, it works. It's not trivial. It works. Assuming there's no errors. Any other questions? Cool. <laughs>